I, I really felt when, when reading, uh, kind of what Tony was saying, re- removing, um, uh, the, the dealing with the tensions, it, it seems like that's an easier way. I felt like I was kind of reading the Jesus seminars again mm. and, and, and it felt like, uh, some of the the quotes that you would make, I'm like, this is something that like John Shelby Spong would would be <laughs> comfortable <laughs> with, with saying. And, 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 and right, I you know, I, I I really do take your point of of writing fiction isn't lying, um, but at the same time, it seems odd that you would still want to be, uh, you know, c- considering uh, what type of Christian you are. And, and and holding to you know if 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 you're a Christian that believes in salvation by 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 Christ, it seems like it's a hard thing to to put into um, into your mind that oh well we can believe the resurrection and kind of like what Peter Enns does he says mm-hmm. you know anything in the Gospels it, uh, that that leads towards salvation is true everything else is eh you know whatever negotiable <laughs> well and especially yeah. since we're told to follow Jesus and I talk about this at the beginning of the Mirror of the Mask right um you know if this gets very practical um suppose you want to comfort somebody who's had someone who's just died and you say jesus said i am the resurrection and the life he that believes in me though he were dead yet shall he live and they say um i read that the gospel authors sometimes embellish jesus words so i'm not (laughs) sure jesus really said that can you use that to comfort somebody as pastoral practice by saying that jesus said it this is something that my my good friend tom gilson has written about quite a lot uh since mirror the mask came out this would alter pastoral practice this would alter teaching and preaching you get up on a sunday morning Mm -hmm. and you say you know here's this incident in the gospels it happened it happened like this yes okay they were not speaking english we're not stupid we know that okay but but at least recognizably if you had known the relevant languages you could have recognized what they were saying um and so for example jesus breathed on his disciples and said receive the holy spirit okay that incident is questioned whether that incident even happened is questioned by some evangelicals um so are you going to feel confident to preach that way and so Thomas said, you know, don't try to don't try to tell us this doesn't matter. This actually does matter. And shouldn't we if this is true, shouldn't we be out there educating all the pastors? Hey, pastors, don't get up on a Sunday morning and say that this happened. Say that Jesus did this because it didn't really happen that way. So you there are guys, real practical consequences with regard to these issues. Mm-hmm. They right? really they really are. You guys and I both know that pastors care about what really happened. And I think they're right to care about what really happened. Mm-hmm. That's why you'll get a pastor and you'll get off in a little rant. You know, the uh, <laughs> let's see, the the wise men didn't come to the manger. Right. I mean, you, I'm sure you guys have heard <laughs> right, the right. sermons. Right. Or no, Mary Magdalene was not a prostitute, you know, or whatever. Right. That, that if there's some tradition that's grown up, that's not historically accurate, the particularly Protestant pastor, though I imagine a a Catholic or liturgical pastor as well could have this concern, wants to pare that away, right? He wants to get us back to what historically really happened. And therefore, they're going to want to know if this is true or not. And I don't think we should patronize them. I don't think we should say, oh, don't don't bother your heads about that. Don't worry about that. I think we should talk to them honestly. And that's why I think they should read read my work because it's good news because uh, it really did happen you know? I, I, I felt too also with with reading this uh it, it reminded me of what origin did with the old testament if mm-hmm. if you can allegorize allegorize everything or anything in the old testament you, you can make it say whatever you want and so by by having these kind of literary devices at, at what point do you stop i mean uh, you know you of course you go along with scholarship and say oh you know uh, uh jesus walking fine, Jesus walking on water, eh, you know, eh, maybe not. And so you, you allegorize uh, the New Testament. I, f- I feel like this is a, an attempt of, of, of the new origin to, to kind of allegorize the New Testament. There is a lot of subjectivity to it. Um, and there's a phrase that I, I really admired D.A. Carson as a scholar. He'll use the phrase without objective control. And I think that's what you're getting at, that this is without objective control. Yeah. Very often you'll find that just the fact that somebody could think of a theory is enough to 
give that theory credit. So um, I'll give you an example. There's the theory that John changed the time when Pilate condemned Jesus um, because there's an apparent contradiction between John and Mark about what time of day it was. I tend to go for a scribal error theory on that one because the they used these little um what would i call them it's it's like a shorthand okay for a number and the number six and the number three were very similar and that it might have just been a very early scribal error to confuse the the six and the three but anyway um the more the more scholarly literary theory is that john changed it for a symbolic reason so uh, one symbolic reason is supposed to be so that Jesus would die at the same time that the lambs were being killed in the temple. Well, I mean, John doesn't mention when the lambs were being killed in the temple. He doesn't even bring up lambs anywhere there. And besides, when you have hundreds of lambs, you're not killing them at the any one time in the temple. It takes a while to kill all those lambs, right? You know, so I mean, it's just not plausible. And John's uh, Gentile readers and, and he's probably writing after the fall of Jerusalem, maybe even some of his younger Jewish readers wouldn't even know what the practice was as far as when they killed the lambs in the temple. So this is a very implausible theory. So you go to uh, Dr. Craig Keener's commentary on the Gospel of John, and to his credit, he brings up some of these arguments against that theory about the lambs being killed in the temple. But then he says, but... Um, Readers of John will recognize that it was at the sixth hour when Jesus was weary when he sat down at the well in John chapter four. So it's like we have to have some symbolic theory. Like we realize that this business about the lambs being killed, that's not going to fly. So now we bring up some different thing about it was to, to recall the, the time when Jesus was weary. And it's like, you know, why not just say that there's something we don't know, maybe a scribal error, maybe a rounding difference between John and Mark or whatever, that actually explains why they appear to differ here. Instead of trying to make, it's like we could just make up some theological motive that the author might have had. And we're trying to read the author's mind. Uh, and that is without objective control. 